Thank you, Jesus. Amen. <coughs> Excuse me. Can you just turn to two people and just say something nice to them, especially somebody you don't really know? Something good. Amen. Can you do that for me? Amen. Turn to at least two people. Turn to get to two people and tell them something good, something encouraging. You know, tell them, God bless you. You look wonderful today. You are nice. Amen. Are we doing that or are we shy or something? I want you to preach to somebody. Just give a word of encouragement. Just tell them, let them know that they are loved. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Can we all stand up, please? Please, can we all stand up? <laughs> I know I wanted to get you out of your comfort zone. Can you go to at least one more person and say something nice to them? Something good, something. God bless you. I'm so glad you're here this morning. You look wonderful. Just. <laughs> Feel so honored to be part of your gathering this morning. What a pleasure to be here. Amen. Amen. All right, you may be seated if you've done that. And then we will uh, we'll continue right after into the fellowship hall when we have lunch and get to visit and get to know each other more intimately. Amen. And uh, before I read uh, my test, if you have your bulletin, I want you to look at it, the encouragement corner with me. Do you have this? Do you get, if you got one of this, can you open to one side there? And uh, you'll see encouragement corner. 1 Corinthians 13 verse 5. It, it does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Find friends. Now, this is very important. Find friends who model forgiveness and refuse to build a wall of bitterness over their heart. This is a rare virtue in our culture. So if you find someone modeling gospel-centered forgiveness, hang on to them. That is to say, look for men and women who will teach you the act of forgiveness, the act of unconditional love, love without string attached. This morning, if you have your Bible, open with me to Genesis chapter 50 from verse 15 to 20. Now I'm reading quickly uh, verse 15. When Joseph's brother saw that their father was dead, they said, it may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil that we did to him. So they sent a message to Joseph saying, your father gave this command before he died. Say to Joseph, please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin because they did evil to you. And now please forgive the transgressions of the servants of the God of your father, Joseph, uh, of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. His brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. Verse 19, But Joseph said to them, Do not fear, for am I in the place of God? Verse 19, But Joseph said to them, Do not fear, am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. Am I in the place of God? This morning, as we continue, if you were not here last Sunday, and since the beginning of this year, like we said, we've been trying to get us into the act of prayer, learning how to pray and to pray well. 
And so we've been dealing uh, with two scriptures or two subjects, our principal character. And the main person that we've been dealing with was the man David, who later became the king of Israel, the second king in that line. And last Sunday, and we looked at it together with Matthew chapter 6, where the disciples or the apostles came to Jesus and they had a discourse with him. And it went this way, like you and I know very well. When they came to Jesus and they said, teach us how to pray, even as John taught his disciples how to pray. And so it was from that discourse that we got what we call our Lord's Prayer today. It wasn't a method, so to speak. It was giving us a guideline of how to pray. It's not telling us what to pray. Jesus said, this is how you should pray. He didn't say, this is what you should pray. And so when we recite the Lord's Prayer, actually it's just giving us the guideline. And when we come before the Father to pray, this is how we should go. And so the Lord God, Jesus Christ, began to set up that principle for us. And we've been saying it from the first word, which was our Father, and how we dealt with that a few, a few weeks ago. And when we looked at, again, hallowed be your name, learning to praise and to worship God. And the only way we can worship God well is when we know him as our Heavenly Father, because if we are not able to differentiate between our heavenly father and our earthly father, then it's going to be a dysfunctional relationship. Because many of us do not have a very good testimony about our earthly father. So the moment we hear the word father, what comes to mind is the betrayer, the abuse, the abandonment we suffered in the hand of our earthly father. And it's difficult for us to translate that and to move from that emotional damage or whatever you want to call it. And now to begin to focus on our heavenly father. And we looked at that deeply and we saw that. And we kept going down, give us this day our daily bread. And we looked at that. And this last Sunday, we were looking at verse 12. Forgive us our trespasses. Amen. You know, and we looked at forgiveness, which became a platform for you and for me to begin, for you to experience divine intervention in your life. We must learn the act of forgiveness. Because Jesus said, we must learn, we must forgive. And so forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. And so we looked at the consequences of unforgiveness last Sunday. We see the damage that unforgiveness creates in people's lives. And I read something to you last Sunday, for those of us who were here, from a medical journal, not from the Bible, where medical science has come up with something that we already know to be a fact, that 61% of cancer cases are traced to the issue of unforgiveness. Isn't that dangerous? That cancer and other sicknesses can be traced to the issue of unforgiveness in people's lives. This was medical research, medical science. This was not church. This was not from the Bible. Amen. So it was not a religious. So looking at the issue of forgiveness is not looking at it. It's deeper than looking at it from that little scope of religiosity. It is more than that. It is everything that has to do with your life and my life. And so we looked at the consequences last Sunday of unforgiveness. The damage it creates and it causes in people's lives. And so, but this morning briefly, and it so happened that Today is a day that men have chosen to celebrate love. And so we're going to be looking at, I'm saying all that to come to what I want to share with you briefly this morning, that we're going to be looking at the benefit of forgiveness. We've looked at the consequences, the danger, the damage that it creates and it causes in people's life. But this morning we're going to look at the benefit of forgiveness. 
We're going to look at the reward that comes with forgiveness. We're going to look at the blessings that come when we forgive. We're going to look at the benefit that comes to us when we feel and we choose to do the right thing according to God's word. And I know you and I will say forgiveness is not easy. Of course it's not. It's not easy to forgive. But the good news about forgiveness, like I said last Sunday, to recap it a little bit again, is this to get you in line here. When God forgives, forgiveness in God's definition is this. Forgiveness simply means it never happened. Amen. When God forgives, God defines forgiveness as it never happened. What does it mean by that? So when God says, when you go to God this morning, and that's why the Bible said the steadfast love of the Lord never sees it. It's new every morning. Every day is a new day with God. And so when I go to God this morning and confess my sins and ask God to forgive me, the Lord forgives me and is done. That issue is no longer in existence. That file has been thrown away. And so when I go to God tomorrow, and I'm talking about what I did yesterday that I've repented of, then we're having a wrong conversation because he doesn't remember, <coughs> literally. So God doesn't even know what you're talking about because that issue was dealt with yesterday. It is gone. It never happened. And that is what forgiveness is. And that is what it means. But for you and me, it's a different ball game altogether. Amen. I forgive you until. Amen. <laughs> I forgive you until you do it again. I come to you this morning and say, I'm sorry for what I did yesterday. And you say, oh, don't think about it. Don't worry about that. Right? We, just, we are very quick to do that. Oh, it's okay. It's nothing. And then two weeks later, I do something else. And then you turn around to Brother John and you say, you don't mind him. That was how he did what he He did the same thing two weeks ago. And I forgave him. No, you didn't forgive. Because if you forgive, you will not recount it. When you forgive, you don't remember. When you forgive, it never happened. When you forgive, it's non-existence no more. And this is where it is hard to really forgive. But if we can learn to forgive, then we can really begin to experience the goodness of God. So when Jesus says, forgive us our debts, he was teaching us a principle where the key to total victory in Christ lies. That we must learn when we go to pray, we must start it on those precepts, forgiveness. <clears throat> so this morning, as we look at Genesis 50, another interesting story. So we're going to look at Joseph this morning. In verse 19, he said something that caught my attention a few days ago. I've read that story time and time again. And even as a young a student in the Bible college, teaching that in the Sunday school and uh, children evangelism, one of my favorite stories to teach was the story of Joseph. I love Joseph. I could relate to him. But I never saw verse 19 until a few days ago. So I was thinking about Sunday. And Joseph says something. He said, am I in the place of God? Then I realized is that bearing grudges, carrying unforgiveness, is putting myself in the place of God. That is to say, I am the one to judge you. I am the one to take vengeance on you. Because when I am angry at you, when you've offended me, and I refuse to let go, because the Bible says vengeance is the Lord. Now, because what, what we looked at, the consequences of unforgiveness, the bitterness that it creates, and it re results onto anger. Anger leads to death. And so when I refuse to forgive you, I am taking the place of God in your life. And Joseph said, I can't do that. And when I saw that, and I said, wow, is that heavy? Unforgiveness is that serious. So bearing grudges put you in a place of God. And we must understand this. So this morning, as we talk about 
love Valentine Day this morning. I want to look at it. How do we spare love from God's premise as God's children? How do we define love this morning in relation to forgiveness? This is how there are many ways to spell love as a child of God. Joseph was so offended, dealt, the brothers wanted to kill him. They sold him out and forgot all about him until that fateful incident that happened and they became hungry. But God had a plan. And let me tell you, child of God, for somebody here, whatever you're going through, God has a plan for your life. Joseph said you meant it for evil, but God, listen to me, your story is not over yet. Whatever you are going through is just a season. These two shall pass. What the enemy is planning to do against you, whatever God allows, God takes responsibility for it. Evil is not from God, <clears throat> but if God allow it, it's because God has seen a potential that he can use that situation to bring about a greater good in your life. And that is why we suffer what we suffer sometimes. Joseph at the beginning did not see God in the midst of what he was going through. Why should you tell me that this is God's plan for my brothers to hate me so much? Why should you tell me this is God's plan to me for me to be betrayed? Why, why should you say to me this morning that it is God's plan for my father to abuse me the way he abused me as a child? Why will you say it is part of God's plan for my husband to betray me the way he did? But I don't know, I don't have answers to all the things you went through that has created the pain and the vacuum in your heart this morning. But one thing I do know, that the same God of Joseph is still on the throne. And that same God is able to turn around your captivity and to fill your mouth with laughter if only you will give him the opportunity to do it for you like he did it for Joseph. If we can learn to let go and let God in the midst of our trial, in the midst of our darkness, then we can see the hand of God in the midst of that darkness. Then the light of God will shine if we can let go. Now, I used to teach my children back then in the Sunday school back then as a young man. And I said, I believe that Joseph was the one that composed the song. He has promised me he will never fail. His faithfulness is forevermore. I will lean on him. Because I believe that despite everything, what kept Joseph going was the fact that he knows that God is able to do abundantly above all that he could ever think or imagine. That though he slay him, yet he would trust in the Lord. That when he was thrown into the pit, instead of him to give up on God, he still held on to God. He didn't hold on, he didn't bear no grudge against his brothers, they didn't know. Like Jesus, he was able to say, Lord, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. Lord, I don't know what your plan is for my life, but I'm willing to trust you in spite of what I'm going through right now. And he went through that pit experience like you and I know. And when he finally got to Potiphar's house, you know the story for those of us who know the story of Joseph. Here he was, and I believe finally he will say, oh, finally, it is time for me to rest. And suddenly the enemy brought, because where God was taking him to was the throne. And everything was a process to where he was going. Every, listen to me, child of God, this morning. When you hold on to God, and if you can let go of grudges and bitterness, every stumbling block will become a stepping stone to a greater thing for you. That is what God does. When Pontiphar's wife came to him, and he said no. Listen to a man called Joseph who understood the mind of God even in the pit and in the darkest time of his life. He said, far it be from me to sin against God by doing this to my master. He was more concerned about his relationship with God. The God that did not deliver him from his brother's hand. You know that. Why should I still be talking about God when he didn't deliver me, when my brothers were selling me out? Why should I still serve this God? Who was not there for me when my brother threw me to the pit and then sold me as a slave? Now I'm in, I'm in Egypt. It is by sheer providence and luck that I found myself in Pontiphar's house. I may have to do what I need to do to survive now because God has abandoned me. If Joseph has thought that way, he would be right. How many times have we 
got into a situation where we can't find our way out and we begin to uh, uh, receive the voice and believe in the lie of the devil that God has abandoned you. But Joseph, no. He said, no. I know my God has his eyes on me. And I know you have have been elevated temporarily. But this is not enough for me to deny my God. And he said, far it be from me to sin against my God. The same God who did not deliver me, but I will still trust him. And he know the story. And he was thrown into the prison cell because he chose to serve God. And there in the prison, you will expect that it is time for Joseph to deny his faith and to become bitter and angry. But no, Joseph did not. He was still serving God faithfully in the prison. Because he knew that the God that he served is able to do abundantly above all that he can think or imagine. He can't see where God is going, but he knows that God is God's future. He knows that God has got him covered, and he trusted in God. And it was the process, because God wanted to give him the whole nation of Egypt. And he had to go through that process. And in that process, Joseph's life began to teach you and me how to spell love. Love simply means I will not give up on you because of the offense. Joseph never gave up on God. He never gave up on his relationship with his brother because of the offense. Listen to me, I know you've been offended. I know you've been let down. But don't let them control. Like I said to you last Sunday, don't give the remote of your destiny to somebody. You know, the the painful thing about unforgiveness with some of us is that the person that offended us, they are dead and gone. Isn't it a shame on us that the dead man is still influencing the way we think and do things? (laughs) Amen. Have you ever thought about that? He's dead, buried. Rotten. If you go dig out the grave now, even the bones maybe is all decayed and gone. But they still have so much power over you even in death. And what all forgiveness does to you and me is that whatever abuse, whatever betrayal, whatever damage that, that was caused by that man, as long as you still bear grudges in the, in, over that issue, they still have control over you. And so they keep, um, they may not be there physically, but they still have so much power. Amen. The moment you think about them, everything just changes that day. Amen. You are happy just having a good time with your friends, and suddenly you see them pass, and that whole day is gone. They don't even have to say a word. Amen. You know, and they have so much power. Why give so much power to people? Unforgiveness means giving power to men that they don't deserve. Giving people control over your life that they do not deserve. But when we learn to spare love, we can say, in spite of the, I will not give up on this relationship, in spite of the offense, I still care for you even after you have wronged me. That is how we spare love. Spare love means I will not use the wrong you've done to me to control or intimidate you. And that is one of the dangerous things we do. As some of us, especially in relationship, husband and wife or children to parents, and as long as somebody, they did something, they are in trouble. How many of us have parents like that? Amen. That offense you committed two years ago becomes the chain. Amen. The moment you cough, they say, huh. <laughs> You started again. <laughs> Amen. It's never ended. You don't do that for a child of God. Don't do that to people and don't let people do that to you. You must learn to love unconditionally. We cannot allow other people's wrong to control us or to intimidate us or to manipulate us with the offense of yesterday. So we can say, I will not allow the offense of yesterday control our relationship or decide the way I feel about you emotionally. 
I will not keep records of wrongs that you've done to me. And this is all in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 that I'm saying to you right now. In spite of what you've done to me like Joseph, I would choose to believe for a better future. Isn't that great? Joseph was so wronged by Pontifus' wife, by his brothers, yet he chose to believe. And this is how you can fly in spite of the limitation. Because what unforgiveness does to you is that it limits you. It cripples you. Unforgiveness incapacitates your destiny. And you can't allow it. If Joseph had allowed that, maybe he would have died in that pit. Maybe he would have died in Pontiphar's house house unknown. Maybe he would have died in the prison cell. But he kept an attitude that I would not allow what happened to me to cripple my future. Because I know one thing. The Bible says in, in the book of Corinthians, it says, no eyes have seen. No ears have heard. Neither has it entered into the heart of man what God has prepared for those who love him. There is something that that God has for you. There is a future waiting for you that you can't allow unforgiveness to rob you of. Because the benefit also of forgiveness, it opens up He opens us up to receiving from God. This is what Jesus was saying. If you want to receive quickly from God, learn to forgive. Matthew chapter 6 verse 15 said, If you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your heavenly Father forgive you your own trespasses. He puts us also in a receiving position when we pray. When you want to receive, if if you want, if sometimes you've been praying. Listen to me, child of God. Examine your heart. Maybe you're not, you don't sin. You're not in adultery. You don't lie. You don't cheat. You don't steal. And you say, why is God not answering me? Jesus said, if you have, if you come with a gift to the author, and you remember that you have hurt against your brother, what did he say? Leave that and go make peace. Before you continue, forgive us. You know, Jesus said, you are praying. You, you, you can fast until you are blue in the face from sun up to sun down. And nothing is happening. Maybe it's time to check. Is there unforgiveness in your heart? If you want to be spiritually mature and productive, you need to forgive. That is part of the benefit of forgiveness. The second Peter chapter one verse eight says, "For these qualities are yours and are increasing, and they keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in the knowledge of God." So, if you want to be productive spiritually, if you want to be effective spiritually, if you want to be a spiritual dynamite in the hand of God, then learn to forgive because there is so much benefit. It's for your own good and my own good if we can forgive. And the good thing is that it makes you a happier person anyway. Amen. Is that not true? Because when you don't forgive, <laughs> you, know, you, you know, it's sad because we've gone through all that, right? You are so miserable every time you think about them. You think about this person, it could be your father, your friend, your ex, your brother, just the top, and, 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 and God forbid, the one that you are angry with or at, and then maybe they begin to do better than you in life. Oh boy, you want to die. <laughs> Amen. <clears throat> Suddenly he's driving a new truck, and yours just broke down, and he just drove past. And you just went, <laughs> You know, it's not worth it. You need to. Because forgiveness makes you what? A happier person. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 20 has this to say, He that handleth a matter wisely shall find good. And, and, and who's trusted in the Lord, happy is he. You see, if you can handle this matter of forgiveness wisely, you say you'll become a happy person. Happiness becomes yours. Yes. 
When we forgive, we become more spiritually alive. And then, the one we talked about last Sunday, health. It gives you a healthy life, makes you a healthier person. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 18 said, There is one whose rash words are like a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. The tongues of the wise bring healing. The tongues of forgiveness brings healing to your body. Listen to me. Love is spelled forgiven. This is the whole point this morning. As we think about Valentine or whatever this morning, Love is spelled forgiven. The true spelling of love is forgiven. If you want to correctly spell the word love, is forgiven. That is how to spell love. The Bible says in the book of John, chapter 3, verse 16, before we see John as we pray this morning, Romans chapter 8, 5, verse 8 says, For God showed his love for us while we are yet sinners. God showed his love for you and me. In John chapter 15, verse 10 to 12, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I keep my father's commandment and I abide in his love. This things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy will be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. That means there is no room for unforgiveness in my heart. And so John 3 16 said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him. You don't even have to be church friendly to know that. Amen. Everybody knows John 3 16. I knew John 3 16 before I started going to church. Amen. <laughs> For God so loved the world. But that's why I was looking at it this morning. I saw it uh, somewhere and I picked it. And I borrowed it. And in John 3, 16, you will find Valentine there. Amen. So the true meaning of Valentine is John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So as we see in between John 3, 16, you can pick out what? Valentine. So what do we need? So the only way to show true love is forgiveness. And the only way to show true love was what God came to show us. And this morning, that is what God is saying to you and to me. Can we all stand up, please, as we pray? Can I have uh, Tia bring this paper? Thank you. This morning, uh, can you help her, please, uh, Brian, get those papers so we can pass it around. This morning, I'm going to pass a paper to you and a pen, every one of us. I want you to take it home. I want you to do this. I want you to take your time. Think about it. John Trisostin, today is Valentine's Day, but this is the real Valentine. I want you to write a letter. You don't have to send it to the person. Amen. You don't have to listen to me. You don't have to give it to them. But if you so wish you can do that, you may not have to call. If you have to call them, call them. But somebody that you really need to forgive. Amen. Do you hear what I'm saying? Somebody that you really need to forgive. Or somebody, even they may be dead and gone, that you just need to release from your heart, from your life. As you go home today, before you sleep, before you go to bed, take your time. And say, and write them, I love you. I forgive you. Genesis chapter 50, verse 19. Remember that. You are not God. 
Joseph said, am I now in the place of God that I will keep you locked up in my heart and not forgive? Vengeance is the Lord. And say, God, I can't do this. You help me. And there may be one or two or three. Write them. And said, Lord, help me. Holy Spirit, I can't do this on my own. I want you to help me. It could be your son, your parents, or whatever. Something minor. It could be your boss. And if you have the opportunity to tell them to their face, do it if you can. And the Lord, you will see, you become free from that moment. I can tell you from experience, as we pray. And for those of you who've been coming to this church, you know you've heard my story with my dad. I hated my dad so much. Can you sit down for one minute? I just need to do this as we pray. Maybe it will help somebody here this morning. I don't know. Thank you, Lord. It wasn't part of it, but I just, just sense in my spirit to just share this for just a few minutes. I had a very terrible relationship with my father. He's gone now. Terrible, what I mean. When, when the Bible talks about perfect hatred, that's what I had for my dad. I hated him with a perfect hatred. It was bad. And I remember one incident where all the family men, uh, my, uh, my uncles came together to set to an issue between my mom and my dad. Both of them are gone now. And I told my mom, in presence of all my uncles there, and I said, you have a choice. If you choose this man, you lose a son. Now, for a, a boy, as an adult, I wasn't a teenager now, to hate his dad to the point of telling his mom to divorce his own father, then you know that was, that's serious, right? That is bad. And that was how bad it was for me and my dad. And it went on for years. I remember as a young pastor in a church in Zaria, and working with children and dealing with the youth, and my mom passed away, and I stood on the altar. Uh, that was how my healing started. Now, this is the, the, the evil of unforgiveness. I was born again, went through Bible college, started pastoring, but in my heart was this big load of unforgiveness. And I just shove it aside. I don't talk about it. I don't do nothing. And I stood, and as God would have it that morning, I think God was, it came to that point that it was now or never. And I said to the church, I was talking about my mom, and I said, oh, my mom is gone. And I don't remember what I said about my dad. And everybody's jaw just dropped. You know why? Because for the first time, Everybody thought that my dad was long gone. And people came to me, you mean your dad is still alive? I said, yeah. You know, that was that shock. And from that moment, and I went back, and the Holy Spirit says, and the Lord said to me, I'm done with you. Is either you resolve this matter, or I'm not going any further with you. And I kept pushing it aside, pushing it aside, pushing it. But it came to a point I just could not. And so there was a young uh, pastor, a young pastor like me, uh, then Vincent, was the only person that knew about the struggle. And I had to tell him, I said, listen, I'm leaving everything, and I have to go see my dad this time. And I remember traveling for about six or seven hours to where my dad was, and went to do as the Holy Spirit has instructed me, to let it go. And I went, it was about 5 or 6.30 in the morning, and knocked on his door. He was surprised to see me. And he said, you came? Are you in town? I said, yeah. And I went to him, and I asked him to forgive me. And knelt down before him, and I told him I was sorry. And he said, no, he should be apologizing. I said, no, no, no. No, this has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with me. This is me. I am sorry for being a bad son. I am sorry for, especially now that I'm a child of God, 
and doing the wrong thing. I did not represent my God well and everything, and I apologized. And from that moment, and I remember getting him, and I said, listen, I want you to bless me as a father. And for the first time, my dad said something positive about me. I took him out, and there were other things I had to make him do, which was a very spiritual thing that the Holy Spirit showed me. And from that day until his dying day, my dad never called me by my name. If there was any human being that believed in my calling as a pastor, he was that man. He never called me by my name ever again. You know, when I did what I did with him, he just looked at me and he smiled. He took me out under the moon there and he blessed me. And he spoke over my head and things, the heavens over me opened. Because there are some spiritual authority that we can. Unfortunately, God placed things in our lives that we just need to undo ourselves. He will show it to us. And when I did that with my dad and asked for his forgiveness and changed our, the tempo of our relationship, everything around me changed. His life changed. And he never called me. He called me pastor all the days of his life when he died. He had so much respect and honor because of what God made me do. He was healed and I was healed. Listen to me, child of God. And many things that were denied me in life spiritually, God began to release them to me. God, there are many blessings that have been hindered in your life and in my life because of unforgiveness. It's not because you committed adultery and sin, as bad as those things are. Unforgiveness is a cancer. It will eat out your destiny. Eat out the destinies of your children if you're not careful. And there is no better time than today to say, God, help me. The Lord helped me, so I know what I'm talking about. And you too can experience that grace. I was released. I was released. And everything, when I talk about my dad now, I can laugh about all the nasty things that he did to me. I don't get angry at them no more. I talk about him, I love him, I miss him more than I miss my mom because I had a better relationship with my mother. We enjoyed each other, I knew my mom. But my dad, I, don't re I didn't really know. When I was getting to know him, then he passed. But I was glad I made up with him before he went. And so when I think about him, I just, I wish he was here, I would have done this with him, done this with him. So, but it was, it is not a good memory, not a bad one. God can heal your heart if you let him do it. Can we bow our head this morning? Talk to God this morning before we leave here. Today is Valentine's Day. You see all the red things and all that. For me, that red represents the blood of Jesus that can cleanse every heart. I ask Jesus to help you, to help you. I know the pain is heavy. I know the betrayer is beyond words. I know you've been let down. I, you can't even begin to explain it now. But there is nothing God cannot do this morning. Because there are more blessings in letting go than still holding on to this grudge and this pain. It's not going to change your life. But if you let go, your life becomes better for it. Ask the Lord to help you this morning. You want God to forgive you. You want God to bless you. Forgive your son. Forgive your daughter, forgive your mother-in-law, forgive your grandparents, forgive that teacher, forgive that friend, forgive them this morning and say, I let them go, Lord. I can't do it on my own, but I want to say what happened, that abuse never happened. That abuse never happened. I know you were abused, but holding on to that makes you look dirty all the time. You, you, and God is saying, I want to cleanse you, I want to clean you up. I want to make you a virgin again. Yes, you were abused at the age of 16. Right? You were abused when you were five by your father, by your friend, by your uncle. And, 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 and that was terrible. You were raped and all that. And as bad as that is, 
let them go because God wants to give you a new life. The Bible said, behold, if anyone be in Christ, is a new creature. That abuse can be forgotten. And God will say, you, that memory will never haunt you again. That is the power of forgiveness. But as long as you're holding on to it, it keeps hurting you. It's haunting you. You keep having nightmares about the same issue again. It happened 10 years ago, but you still have a nightmare about it. That is the devil trying to hold you bound in that pit of unforgiveness. You're going to say, Lord, help me. I can't continue like this. I'm tired of carrying this load. I want to let it go this morning. Jesus, help me. Help me to spell love correctly. Forgiven. I am forgiven in the Lord. I am forgiven. And I forgive my friend. I forgive them for what they did. Jesus said, forgive them for they know not what they are doing. Jesus spent love on the cross. Stephen was being stoned to death. And he said, Lord, hold not this against them. Because he knows that for him to sit at the right hand of the Father, he cannot go on there with unforgiveness. Lekataria Satan Deneboshi. Jesus wants to release somebody here this morning. Holy Spirit, we just pray for divine touch this morning. Heavenly Father God, I pray for a cleansing this morning. Oh, can we all stand up this morning? Just put your hand on your chest. Just put your hand on your chest this morning. By faith, Father God, we just pray for everyone that is standing this morning. Lord, I don't know what pain, oh God, that they carry in their heart. We don't know, Father God, the grief, oh God. I don't know the abuse. I don't know the misuse. I don't know the level of betrayal, Father God, that they have endured. I don't know how much, oh God, damage the enemy has done to them through the ones they love and trusted. I don't know, oh God, what created that pain, oh God, that has created that bitterness in their heart, oh God. And I know, Father God, the Holy Spirit said, I I know your anger is justified. 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 You are right to feel the way you feel. But the Lord is saying, but it, enough is enough now, my child. Let it go and let me in. Let it go and let me in. So that I can just wipe you clean. So that I can clean you up in the name of Jesus. The Lord wants to give you a new heart. Nobody has the right to occupy the throne of your heart except the Lord Jesus. No man, no woman, no, because unforgiveness is giving somebody else rent-free access to your heart. They stay there and they control your emotion. And God is the only one that should control the way you feel in the name of Jesus. Father God, I pray, Father God, for every broken heart, every broken dream, Every broken trust this morning. Lord, I pray, Father God, the Bible says, is there no balm in Gilead? Lord, I pray from the mountain of God's healing balm. Let the healing flow their heart this morning in the name of Jesus. Lord, even as your children go home today, Lord, and continue in this process, O oh God, of letting go as they write, O oh God, as they write their pain. Lord, I pray, Father God, let the blood of Jesus wash their heart clean in the name of Jesus. Heavenly Father God, I bless them on this special day. Lord, this is the day that men have set aside, oh God, to celebrate carnality. But we set it aside this morning to celebrate our spiritual love and deliverance. We set it aside this day to correctly spell love. Love is forgiven. Love is forgiven. Love is forgiven. Love is forgiven. Father God, because you love us, you forgive us. Lord, because we will love unconditionally like you loved us. Lord, teach us, oh God, to love correctly by forgiving them that have trespassed against us in the name of Jesus. Heavenly Father God, I sanctify this communion table. Whoever, oh God, needs a cleansing this morning, Lord, as they take, oh God, may the blood of Jesus that cleanses us from all unrighteousness, cleanse, oh God, and heal our heart. May the Holy Ghost comfort us, oh God, in the name of Jesus. Lord, I thank you. We praise you because you are a good God. Lord, there is none like you. May this table bring healing today. Emotionally to your children in every capacity in the name of Jesus. Father, we give you praise. We exhort you this morning in Jesus' mighty name.
Amen. Amen. Uh, for anybody who feels like they are taking the communion, I think the worship song will be going on. And uh, if you want to go into the, uh, the fellowship hall, I believe uh, Ade will be ready in a minute. I believe that. And the Lord uh, will bless you. If you want to take the communion this morning, you can come and minister it to yourself. Why I want you to do that on your own volition is part of it. And you're going to say, Lord, as I take this, as I come to take this by faith, I pray, Lord, let the blood cleanse my heart of every pain, every hurt, every bitterness, and just take it and believe God for a miracle that God will release them, release you from that bondage of unforgiveness in the name of Jesus. Oh, thank you, Lord. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. In Jesus' name.